church discipline. What is that? Is that the dis spiritual disciplines? No, that is not spiritual disciplines. This is church discipline, kind of like when we discipline our kids. So it kind of just so sort of happened to coordinate with the day my kids were not being very good and needed a little parental discipline, right? So hopefully that illustrates the point and the need. <laughs> But let's go ahead and read the scripture. We'll pray and we'll get into the message. Matthew 18, verse 15 through 20. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, Tell it unto the church. But if you neglect, neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen or man or a, and a publican. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And again I say unto you, that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Let's pray. Father God, as we open your word, your truth, help us to take it like a medicine. When we receive discipline, help us to receive it like a good medicine. Maybe it doesn't taste good at the moment, but help us to understand that it's good for us. It's good for us to become better to be better, to do better. For the church to be holy, we need this. And for the church to be what you want it to be, we need this. So Father God, as we open up your word, clear my mind of all distractions, clear all of our minds, help our hearts to settle for nothing but the truth. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. All right, so today my purpose for you today is that you will we will all learn to apply the medicine of church discipline, this method, this principle that we're going to be looking at in Matthew 18. When the disease of sin comes into the church or into the life of a member, that we will be able to accept the medicine of church discipline. The ultimate goal for church is holiness. We are to be holy because God is holy. We see that in 1 Peter 1.16, Leviticus 11. It's the same. God is the same you know, in the Old Testament and the New Testament. It does not change. He's just changing his method of revelation and what is being revealed as far as the person of Jesus Christ in the fulfillment of all the Old Testament. So, for example, in Leviticus 11, 44, he says, For I am the Lord your God, ye shall therefore sanctify yourselves. Sanctify simply means to set apart for a specific use. For example, if I were to use my toothbrush to clean the toilet, it is no longer sanctified. It is defiled. Okay. That toothbrush is for one purpose and one purpose only. If I use it for anything else, it's no longer good for its original purpose. Same thing's true with us. We need to be sanctified for the purposes of God. So continuing on that Leviticus 11, 44 verse, it says, Ye shall therefore sanctify yourselves, and ye shall be holy, for I am holy. It's God speaking. Neither shall ye defile yourselves with any manner of creeping thing that creepeth on the earth. And he goes on and on. But we are to be set apart. God doesn't want us to be like the people around us. He wants to be different and distinct. Back in that day, the Egyptians, the people that were around Israel, worshiping all kinds of other gods. He didn't want them to be like that. He didn't want to copy their methods, even though they might have had a good temple worship service. They're worshiping the wrong God. He wanted them to worship him in his way. So why this message today? We don't have a big problem here, right? We're good. We, we got this. Well, this is probably one of the most overlooked passages, and even some of these verses within this passage have been used for out-of-context <coughs> reasons. I've been guilty of it. When you see the verse um, that I just read, um, for example, whatever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. How many times have you heard somebody use that for like praying for the health and wealth type prosperity gospel things? Whatever you bind on earth, that has nothing to do with material gain. It has to do with church discipline. Did you know that? So it's more important than ever that we get this right. When you look at a passage, you cannot take it out of context. You have to look at the text before and the text after. That's what the context is. Con means with. 
what is with that passage. You're looking at before and looking at after. It is not separate. It goes together. Why this message today? Churches are afraid to put this into practice. You look at any uh, a seminary class in church growth, um, they're going to have all kinds of methods of how to grow a church. This would not be on the top of the list for most church, church growth books, church discipline. However, it should be. Because if God's church is to grow legitimately, holiness is one of the areas in which we need to grow. And if we have a big church of 100 or 1,000 people, guess what? If it's not holy, if there's all kinds of immoral activity going on, if there's the unsaved filling its pews, is it really the church? We have to ask ourselves, you know, does it even count as the church if they're not saved? We want unsaved people in the church because we hope that they will get saved. But I want to propose to you that we have to get them saved first before they will set foot in these doors. We have to go out to save them, to share the gospel with them. It's like a criminal. A criminal is not going to be very likely to go into a police station until he's following the law, right? Same thing's true with the sinner. They're not going to set foot in a church where they know that holiness is supposed to be the standard. They're going to be looked at, they're going to be pointed at, but we're not supposed to judge, right? But we have this teaching on church discipline where we're supposed to call out where we see sinning happening. Nobody wants to be called out. And so if we actually implemented this, fear would come upon the church as far as holiness is concerned. We, we might live a little bit better for fear that we would be accused of living immorally. So perhaps when you see empty pews, it might not be a bad thing. If it's for the reason that sinners are not filling the pews. If it's for the reason that God is cleaning house. There was a couple in the book of Acts who brought sin into the congregation. And to show just how seriously God takes this issue, I think we ought to go there. In Acts 4, 435, we have... Various uh, disciples laying down at the disciples' feet their money. They would sell property and they would lay their money at the disciples' feet. And they would distribute it to every man according as he had need. It was a voluntary act. It was not mandatory. Nobody was saying that they had to do this. They were just giving to the church out of, you know, the need. So we see in chapter 5 of Acts says, but a certain man named Ananias, with Sapphira and his wife, sold a possession and kept back part of the price. His wife, also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why had Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and keep back part of the price of the land? Somehow God had revealed to Peter that he was lying about the price. I don't know how. Peter found out, but somehow God revealed it to him, and he knew that he was lying about the price. And sure enough, Peter didn't have to address it much further because God took care of it. It says, uh, Peter said in verse 4, While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was, not, was it not in thine own power? What have you conceived? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied unto men, but unto God. And Ananias, hearing these things, fell down and gave up the ghost. For great fear came on all of them that heard these things, and the young men arose, wound him up, and carried him out, and buried him. See, they didn't, they didn't have corridors, they didn't have funeral homes that would embalm the body back then. If somebody died, they took him outside and buried him because the body starts rotting pretty quick. So before church was over, he was, he was being buried. Verse 7, and it was about the space of three hours after when his wife, not knowing what was done, came in. Peter answered unto her, Tell me where, whether you have sold the land for so much. So he's confirming with her. Is she in on this too? Or is it wasn't just her husband? And she said, Yeah, for so much. And Peter said unto her, How is it that you have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which have buried your husband are at the door and shall carry you out. Then she fell down straightway at his feet and yielded up the ghost. 
And the young men came in and found her dead, and carrying her forth, buried her by her husband. And great fear came upon all the church and upon many that heard these things. And by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. And of the rest, there's no man joined himself to them. People stopped coming to church because they didn't want to die. You know, when weird things happen at cults or churches and people die, uh, other people are like, whoa, danger. You know, something's going on here. We don't want to go. Well, in this, it wasn't anybody in the church that was doing the killing. It was God. And great fear fell upon them, and nobody else wanted to join. That's a good reason for sinners not to want to join, because if you know that you're going to have a problem, you know, being honest or being straightforward with God, church is probably not the place for you. You know, you, you might want to get right with God first and come. But, you know, I encourage people to come to church whether they're cleaned up or not. However, God does require holiness among his people. See, these, these two, this couple, Ananias and Sapphira, they didn't have to give what they gave. They could have given 90% and kept 10% back. They weren't required by God to do what they did. It was voluntary. And they were voluntarily lying to God and the church. But Peter called them out, just like he should have, however it was revealed to him. But this method, this this uh, this is not an outline for how to grow a church. You know, before I see a couple things in here that uh, are interesting. Number one, they had church for three hours. Maybe I was born in the wrong era, but uh, before church was even over, three hours later, that's when the wife came in late, three hours late. <laughs> The fear that fell on the people, though, to respect that they were not to bring among the people. This, this is a, a move of God to create a respect towards God's people. And, and to have a death at the offering is not a way to increase their participation. Anyway, today I'm going to be talking about five aspects of church discipline, how to, um, who the recipient of church discipline ought to be. We're going to talk about the person who initiates church discipline. We're going to talk about the purpose of church discipline. We're going to talk about the process of how it should be carried out. And we're going to talk about the authority for which we do this, the authority by which gives us the permission to do this. So I do want to bring to your attention the context. We've been going through Matthew this year, if you remember, all this year we've been going through Matthew for the most part. But earlier in Matthew, I kind of skipped a little bit of a portion. You know, Jesus is giving this lesson a couple weeks ago, if you remember. He, a little child came to him. And he said, unless you have faith of a child, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. And then right after that, he gives the illustration of the 99 sheep that is left to go save the one. He's giving illustrations of how we ought to look at church members and church. We have to come like a little child. If one is lost, we need to go after them. And even here in church discipline, we're looking at this, if a brother shall trespass against you, here's how we restore them. We don't just accuse them and kick them out. We have a process to bring them back in. Have you ever accused somebody of something and kind of like cornering a dog into a corner, uh, they kind of bite back because we don't give them a gracious way to come back? I think people are the same way. If we back them into a corner, accuse them, point fingers, it's very dangerous for us to get hurt in the process. And if we're not careful, if we don't do it God's way, it's not going to restore them and it's going to get ourselves into sin as well. So we do need to do this God's method, God's way, and with his purpose. Critics of church discipline often even quote Jesus and say that we shouldn't do this. We shouldn't judge others, right? So we shouldn't carry out church discipline. God will discipline him on his own, right? He will, and he does. But then why is this in the Bible? Are we to ignore this among all the other passages? No, we have to do this when it's necessary so that sin will not run rampant in the church. We have to address sin in the church. Leaders compromise in order to try to grow their churches. 
but that's not our concern. Church growth is not our concern. Our concern is holiness. Our concern is uh, being right with God and calling out sin. For legitimate growth of a church, we must do it God's way and under his prescription and under his authority. Jesus said he will build his church and the gates of hell will not overcome it. So I, I myself am tempted to worry about church growth. When we see numbers diminishing, I'm tempted to worry about church growth issues. It's very tempting to try to do all these other things. Well, what's this church doing? What's that church doing? How can we get more people in here? Maybe we need to do this program or that program or this event or that event. And again, I have to remind myself, well, that's a good way to get lost people in the church. But then is it really the church? No. We need to go out there, get people saved, go out in the community, do things in the community, and then get them saved first. And then they will be more likely to come in. Of course, always invite people to church. Maybe there's saved people out there, lost sheep, who don't have a home. We need to invite them to church. But we can't expect sinners to set foot in these doors. The reason so many churches today are not holy, you see people falling, you see people uh, having issues in churches, is because they're not applying the Matthew 18 principle properly. They probably like, somewhat like the Corinthians that Paul wrote to, where he said, For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. What's another uh, reason that people don't do this method? They, they might implement something else instead. Gossip is one of those things that we tend to do. It's easier to gossip about somebody than to approach them about the issue at hand, right? All of us are guilty of it, one way or another, talking about the person rather than to the person. That's not God's method. All right. And in 1 John, he even says, If any man see his brother sin, a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask and he shall give him life for, that, for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death, he says. I do not say that he shall pray for it. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. Is that kind of confusing? He's saying, if you're, if you're sinning not a sin unto death, which we can get into that, but I'm not going to touch on that right now, then you need to try to restore them. Okay? But there are occasions where we don't need to restore people. If they're not hearing us, if they're not having it, Paul even went so far, and we'll get into this in a minute, where he turned people over to Satan. They wouldn't have him, so he didn't try to restore it. He didn't try to forgive him. He was turning them over to Satan. He was done with them. Okay, we'll look at a few of those passages later on. But of course, many of the Proverbs also encourage its reader to be ready to take action um, and to take correction. So, for example, Proverbs 3.11 says, My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. For whom the Lord loveth, he corrects even as a father, the son, in whom he delights. Proverbs 13 says, He that spareth the rod hates his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him. Be times. Be times being soon, promptly. If you love your son, you discipline them promptly. You don't wait, you know, a couple days and then, hey, you remember that thing you did? Hey, here's a spanking. He's not going to learn that way. But if the discipline is quick, he's going to learn same thing's true in the church. If we let something fester for days or months or years, it's going to fester and it's going to ruin relationships. It's going to put a divide in the church. So as soon as something happens, we need to try to discipline quickly as possible. Maybe we need to cool down first. Maybe there doesn't need to be a period where we pray about this, we write down our thoughts, we write down some scripture, and, and in order to be able to do this in a loving manner, but we need to do it as promptly as possible. In private. All right. Some other proverb says, uh, let's, uh, Hebrews uh, quote some of these proverbs about God disciplining those he loves. In Hebrews 12, 7, 11, 7 through 11, where he says, If you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as a son, son or a daughter. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? But if ye without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then you are bastards. That means somebody born outside of wedlock. Okay, that's what it says. And not sons. Furthermore, we have fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much 
rather be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? We listen to our Father. Should we listen to the Father God more so? Yeah. For verily a few days chasten, for verily for a few days chasten us after their own pleasure, but He God for our profit, that we might be partakers of His holiness. He's not disciplining for us for His own good. He's disciplining us for our good, for His holiness, so that we can partake in His holiness. So today again, we're going to be seeing five aspects of church discipline principle of Matthew 18. If you ever hear me refer to this principle, hey, I'm coming to you in the spirit of Matthew 18, this is what I'm talking about. Okay? You may have somebody come to you and say that. Hey, I'm coming to you in the spirit of Matthew 18. They're saying, hey, I'm coming to you in an attempt to restore. I've seen something wrong that I want. Maybe I misunderstood, but here's what I'm seeing. And so you need to listen and you need to take it to heart. We're going to see aspects of the recipient, how to initiate it, the purpose of church discipline, the process of church discipline, and the authority for church discipline. So first, we're going to look at the recipient of church discipline. Everybody here, at one time or another, should be the recipient. We need to be called out, and we need to be brave to hear correction. Verse 15.